in. When I first started, I'd show up to the office, and we decide what to do, and we go out to the field, and uh, he dropped me off, and uh, and he go back to the office, and I put the sensors in. But now, I show up to the office, he goes to put the sensors in, <laughs> right? And I know, because here, look, 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 who's doing it? So that's great because uh, I get tired of putting sensors in. But uh, that's how it's got to move. We got to move to. Uh, we got to. We got to do it ourselves. So uh, I was real. This was a great year. It was great to see uh, a big transition. And you actually used them. You made phone calls, and uh, and uh, that's that's what it's about. And it's a learning process. So when sensors, uh, you got to clear your mental, emotional, and physical space, and then you'll see. But it's hard at first. It's a steep learning curve. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that the yield contest, we have a round table on it tomorrow. tomorrow. If you're interested about learning about how some of these guys uh, won the contest, or it's, a, it's an interesting uh, session. Never been done before, irrigation contest, our knowledge. Um, so will we be in short supply in Arkansas? We're only about 50% sustainable in our withdrawals. We're looking at running out of water only be able to meet our demand, about 20% of our demand by 2050. So that's essentially shutting off about half of our wells or like taking all of our soybean production and converting it to dry land is kind of a rough way of looking at it. That's how dire it is. And Dr. Kreutz brought that out this morning in the, uh, in the keynote. I always, uh, like I saw in uh, Wes's presentation, we always talk about building a solid pyramid Tommy brought it out. You want to have a good pump, flow meter, know what you're doing. Um, get your water across the field or, or across your pivot uniformly. And at the very top really is when you start implementing sensors uh, scheduling. And then they all feed back into the other because everything fits together. You'll see things with sensors that will bring out problems that um, you didn't realize. Um, most people are using uh, a visual stress look at the crop and decide if it's stressed and decide when to irrigate. Uh, however, we started to see a big uptake in sensors in recent years. This is an irrigation survey we did uh, in, uh, across the state. Uh, what I've noticed, and this is 16 data, so I think it's higher than this now, but Mississippi has very well, very widely seems to have adopted sensors. Um, <coughs> And what's interesting is most of them may not know which sensor they're using, but they're using them. This tells me that the consultants are probably using these sensors to make decisions in Mississippi. So large-scale large adoption of sensors in Mississippi looks like Arkansas, we're, we're trying to get up there. In Louisiana, Missouri, if you're uh, in there, you know, you're way behind. It's time to catch up, guys. Your neighbors are getting ahead of you. Uh, Dr. Kreutz and I, uh, uh, we have, he has a student, uh, Mr. Spencer, wrote a really nice paper. We put our data together from, from doing demonstrations like uh, Tommy Young. Uh, and uh, this is in the process of being published, but it was really uh, uh, telling for today, for this presentation. I thought it was really key. So, um, well, we put, uh, we do these paired comparisons. We have uh, irrigation water management for irrigation. We have hole selection, surge, and sensors versus a control field. We put a flow meters on both. Then we look at yield and water use, differences between those. We did it in soybeans, found the same result. But I gave, uh, I gave these guys my data. I only have four data points. I have a hard time in Arkansas getting people to not to follow using sensors, uh, not been as successful as Mississippi. But uh, we saw uh, a reduction in total water applied, almost 40%, an increase in corn grain yield. And both of these are significant. Uh, and an improvement in uh, net returns. So this stuff pays for itself, as Tommy indicated earlier, and there's data behind and there are the p-values to go with it. So uh, it does work. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the watermark sensor. What I'm gonna focus on is one of the big issues with sensors is how to interpret them. And so I'm gonna go through how to, you know, there's one time in the, in the year where you, if you only, if you put sensors out and you only use them for, for terminating, you'll get a lot of benefit from a sensor. If that's all you use it for, you get a lot of benefit just on the termination side. So I'm gonna go through how you can do that using sensors and some basic math in a, in a mobile app. Because it's really easy and if you can figure that out, 
uh, you'll never go back to guessing on when to stop irrigating. <coughs> okay, so watermarks, the range on them, so you know, is around zero to 239 centibars, uh, about $35 each. There's a, uh, the, they get a good price point, which is why everybody uses them. This is how you put them in, and uh, Tommy passed them. These are actually Tommy's fields right here. I should have shared them with him, but that's, uh, these are the sensors we put in this, uh, this year. You don't have any trouble with them. Rodents, you, think, those waters? you know, I have once in a while, but it's not, you know where I have trouble is, is raccoons. If I don't get the wires in that row, the raccoons will catch them and drag them apart and pull them apart. I'm going to make one comment about that. I didn't have any problems, but I did have one, one sensor set where I had one wire that was messed up. And that's one reason I like using the four watermark sensors because if I'd have been using the one that had all of them in the same sensor, I would have had no data whatsoever. And I still maintain data, but I just knew that something was wrong with that one sensor. We've had problems with, I think uh, the peanut, for some reason, houses rats and mice really bad. Yeah. And then we even have problems with coyotes and other stuff out there chewing on. So if you've seen some of our sensor systems. We have to, like, in case Armor. we're flexible, hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, kind of it's it. a regional so, thing, but yeah, I mean, I, I can count, maybe I can think of four sensor installations we had issues with over the last five years. Uh, have you had any of the watermarks in excessively sand, really sand? Uh, so, we, yeah, so yeah, well, so usually when we get really sandy soils, like some of the peanuts, we'll use a capacitance probe. But most of them have enough silt in it in Arkansas that the watermarks work on probably 90% of our soil types. We're, we're good in Georgia, but when you move to North Florida, we get yeah. those like really deep Coarse sand. sand. They will. Yeah, they're, um, there is some problems with them being there. Yeah, that's right. Getting that really, uh, coarse sand. Really, really coarse sand. Soil. <coughs> soil when you do that, do you change the types of sensors yeah. and get a better reading due to. Oh, there's no good readings. What? No good reading. <laughs> that's, that's good reading. Yeah, look at the trends, and yeah, I just have to interpret what what the sensor is telling you. But yeah, they're not, and they're not and they're relative on a capacitance probe, so got to use the software. So uh, one thing I'll tell you is uh, make sure you um, mark where these are in corn if you've never used them, because it's no fun trying to find them. You can't uh, pull them out at the end of the year. So that's what sen sensor installation looks like. I'll come in late. Sometimes we can't get them in until the corn's. Uh, V10 or V12 because it rained all spring and so I'll come in and put them at a little bit of an angle but I'm always trying to get them in the row uh, so these are at a slight angle. Our standard recommendation Arkansas 6, 12, 18 and 30 we're looking at a, a, a two and a half to, to three foot profile usually. We do four sensors so if one we lose one we can still make good decisions. You can get by with three and you can shallow them out but this just seems to work for us. Uh, we put them two thirds to three fourths down uh, the furrigated field and we uh, focus a lot on installation. That's, that seems to be the biggest issue if they fail. Um, put them in the row. Um, and we've come up with uh, three fact sheets to help uh, farmers with sensors. We use these in our schools. One fact sheet's on how to put them together, uh, and how to assemble them and condition them. The second one is on how to use and interpret them. And then the third one's on how to terminate using sensors. And so I'm gonna kind of focus on that one. But to help with interpretation, which is always hard, I've come up with a mobile app. It's on the App Store for Apple. And what you do is you, um, you put in your sensor readings, and I give you four slots for that. And uh, you put in, you, you can have them at any depths, uh, but you have to pick your effective rooting depth and the sensors that are in that effective rooting depth. So if you're early, you only want to use 18 inches, you can put 18 inches in. If you're going through, your, you want to use a three foot profile to terminate, you can put 36 in. Then you pick your soil type, you put silt loam. We have silt loam with a pan. They're, they're, these are water retention curves for our soil types in Arkansas. And then I, then I allow you to, uh, to pick your allowable depletion. So if you are very risk averse, you can pick a low allowable, low allowable depletion or managed allowable depletion, like a 30 or 35 percent. If you're trying to really squeeze it, like you're in the contest and you want to go to 45 or 50 percent, maybe in furrigation, you get to pick kind of your risk level or even old pivot or new pivot or new pump or old pump on that system. Then you hit calculate and it averages those center bar readings 
and then it converts it to available water, and then it tells you. Says it's off the screen, but it says um, it says the average reading is this. The remaining available water in the profile is 1.17 inches. So if you're using water. 0.3 inches a day, that's three days. You've got to be done irrigating by the end of the third day. It takes you 24 hours to get across. In two days, Bubba needs to go fire up the pump. Okay, so it helps kind of with the interpretation of when do I need to start, you know, and if I'm farther out, I'm wanting to estimate when I might need to start up or hit that field. It's a lot easier than trying to figure out when a cinnabar, re when you're going to get to 80 or 90 cinnabars or 100 center bars, or in a silt loam, it might be 36 center bars, or sandy soil, excuse me. So um, so that's why we've come up with the app, and uh, it's you know it's something you can do in, in about um, you know, 15, 20 seconds. You can enter the data in and hit calculate and get a number and make a decision. That's a good time spent, because if it saves you from running a pump for you know, 24 hours, you're getting a field, you, you made a lot of money just taking that time to make that decision. Um, so terminating, you know, growth stage in uh, corn. I'm going to look at the starch line. You almost know how to do that on corn. Okay, so um, when we're trying to terminate, we're going to look at the water balance. We want to balance the, how much we need with what's available in the root zone and take out if we have any rainfall. Um, <clears throat> And then we've got to add, if we know we need some water, we've got to also account for irrigation efficiency, right? Because our, machine, our machines or our systems are not 100% efficient. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So on the left, we have uh, growth stage, R4, R5, R6, R7. I don't know why this is doing that to me. So if I'm halfway down the milk line, on R5, I need 2.2 uh, inches to finish the crop out. If I'm earlier than that, I need 3.7. So let's just say uh, we're half, the starch line's halfway down. All right, we need 2.2 inches to finish the crop out, okay? Now, if you've got watermarks, you can go out and read them. <laughs> let's just assume we have a silt loam at uh, 60 centibars. We know for our soil type, that's 0.63 inches of water. Uh, per foot, and that's a figure in a 50% allowable depletion. So if I'm going to terminate, I want to use everything I can at the end. If I'm in mid-season, I might not want to use 50%. I could back up if I'm not comfortable with that. But uh, when you terminate, you're trying to get everything out. You can, right? So you're going to use your most effective, your deepest root zone, the deepest you're comfortable with, and let's try to use all of the allowable depletion we got, we want, we can get because we're going to finish it out. Anything that's left is money left on the table. Okay. All right, so 6.63, if you got two feet, it's 1.2, okay? You got 1.2 inches of water left. How much do you need? 2.2, so you need an inch, right? You need a little bit more than an inch. Let's say we had a two and a half foot rooting zone, and we're comfortable with that, 2.6 inches of water. 2.2 minus 1.6 is 0.6 inches of water, right? Actually, yeah, 0.6. All right, we got to account for irrigation efficiency. So divide it by irrigation efficiency is a quick and dirty way of doing it. If you're a fur irrigator, you can figure 70%. That's what I use. Could be higher, could be lower. If you're center pivot, you might use 80. Depends on your pivot. Uh, so if you take 0.6 divided by 0.7, you're 0.86. That's what you need to finish the crop out. Okay, so if it's a pivot, make a turn, you're done. If it's fur irrigation, we're going to irrigate, probably shut it off early, so we don't need to put a pull three inches out. If we're normally putting two to two and a half, we can back it off because the net irrigation needs only about an inch. So we could cut it back early. Shut that off early, you're saving, you're saving money. That's money, diesel fuel you don't have to burn. <coughs> I've got a table in that chart, kind of helps do that. So just to summarize that again, you need 2.2. Figure out from the sensors what you've got left. That's 0.6. I got, I got 0.6. I need 0.6. I'm short. You may have enough. If your center bar readings are higher or lower, you may have enough. What happens if you got, if this is zero or less? You got 2.2 in the soil and you need 2.2, do you need to irrigate? You're done. Go home, right? Finished. Sensors made you money. 
And here, if you get 0.86, let's say you get a rain, right? You get an inch rain, are you done? You're done. Go home. No more. Don't turn the pump on. Save the diesel fuel. So <clears throat> let's say the center bar reading was uh, 50 instead of uh, 60. Now I'm, I only need 0.2 inches. You fire the pivot up or irrigate for 0.2 inches. Tough one, isn't it? I probably just go to church and pray. You get a little rain. Probably you might get it. You get two. You fire. Okay, Tommy, fire. Up. <laughs> turn, turn the turn the turn the timer up. You know, <laughs> speed her up, right? Okay. I mean, that's how you make a decision. I don't need a full inch, but I'm gonna put on here. I need two tenths. But I made. I knew what I was doing. I know I had to. I was gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, but I don't. May not need it. Or maybe you could just turn it on half of it and see if it makes a difference, right? All right, if you want to know more about how to do this stuff and use the app, we have a school we do in Arkansas. It's a four, three to four hour school, depends on the group. I only do max 20 people. We charge 600, we charge $500, but you walk out the door with $600 for the equipment. Because I give you four sensors, a slide hammer, and a manual reader. Go on eBay and try to price that stuff out and buy it yourself, have it shipped to your house. It's all well over $600. The idea is you take the time, learn how to use sensors, build them, actually build the sensors you're going to put in the field, and then we actually go out the door and actually put them in the ground, talk about how to install them. We go through the whole thing. So you walk out the door, you go out of this class with uh, everything you need to go put sensors in the ground, and you actually have the tools to do it. kind of gets you started. So that's the idea behind the class. It's a steep learning curve, right? It's really a steep learning curve, and so the classes are are kind of to help you get over the hump and you're still going to have a, a steep learning curve after that but uh, at least you kind of got the tools to, to walk out the door and do it. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, Jason's chart. He won the corn contest. Eight inches of water. 227 bushels. 227. Eight inches of water. You know, normally, the permit value is 24 inches. Most guys here in Arkansas will irrigate eight times. Eight times two inches to three inches is 16 to 24 inches. He did it on eight. And you look at his data. There's 100, 200 centibars. You know, he he's not got really high numbers. You know, he's not pushing 150 or 200 all the time trying to, you know, trying to squeeze everything he can to win the contest. He's got very conservative, I'd say, charts there. So you might be surprised to start using sensors, even if you don't go real high with them. You know, how much, how much different, how much longer you have to wait? Okay, so I'll end with that. Uh, water will be scarce. IWM, the sensor's got to be applied with other things. Other things, we talked about flow meters, surge valves, hole selections, all got to fit together as a, as a complete package. You can't just put sensors out there and, and just guess on what you're punching holes in, your poly pipe. It all fits together and they interact. Uh, and use the mobile app or fact sheets if that helps you. Soil types vary, so we've adjusted for the soil types. Um, this one number may not work for our different soil types same soil type. So we have one for a, a silt loam with a pan, we have a silt loam, we have a clay, we have a sandy loam. So you kind of pick one that's closest to your soil type. Um, and if you only use sensors twice during the season, you'll get the benefit, you'll get a lot of benefit out of it. So try and decide when to start and when to terminate. If you just do use sensors for those two things, you'll get a lot of benefit from the sensors. <coughs> and then during the season is gravy. Because if you're trying to meet peak water demand, it's going to help you cycle and catch those rainfalls, rainfall events. But if you just terminate on time, you get a lot of benefit out. And you do that, you'll get it. Just use them for that. If you can't handle it, just try terminating with them. And the other thing I'll tell you is you can make money at this because NRCS will cost you on this stuff. This doesn't cost you anything. You'll make, this will make you money. I promise you. It drives me crazy. We spend all this money on planters, sprayers, to figure out, to get, you know, corn plants exactly 6.5 inches apart. And to shut that sprayer off when we get right to the end, 
and yet we're just guessing on how much water we're putting out there, whether we have enough or too much. And we won't spend 100 bucks on an 80-acre field just to put sensors out there to get a feel for when we should irrigate. Cost you more to run the pump for that last irrigation than those sensors cost you. So, anybody have any questions? I'll say too that you know this, this complete system here probably be about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars per set. But there's nothing to say that if you want to, you can put four sensors out and have a manual reader. You just have to walk out there and check them. When you're trying to make a decision, you know, just use the sensors when you're trying to make a call. You don't read them every day. Guess what I'm getting at is the money that we're, we're saving here, you'll want them on everywhere you can get them after you use them and learn how to use them. Make the Interstate guy your best friend. Start writing irrigation water management plans. They'll cover a lot of cost, not all of it. Any more questions for either one of us? All right, well, let's go to lunch. Thanks for listening.